The Audacity of She. Incisive conversations with women who are challenging the status quo to create wildly fulfilling lives. Plus, practical information you can apply to your life right now. Oh, you guys. You're going to love this episode. So what you should do, if you're not already following Kara Marie on Instagram... Take a moment now at the start of this episode, go to Instagram, find her feed. It's Cara Marie Boudoir, B-O-U-D-O-I-R, and check out her work. You're probably going to follow it while you're there, but you have to go look so you have a concept for the caliber of work that she creates. Um, It's pretty inspiring. So do that. And we'll dive in. Kara and I actually had this conversation in December 2017. I just got slammed with my busiest professional stretch yet. And on the heels of that, this is the first thing that I am doing with my spare time. I have been so excited to share this with you. And I know you're going to love her work. So go check it out. You can keep the episode playing and enjoy. Kara, hi. How are you? Hey, Dana. How are you? I'm doing so good. Great now that we're talking. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for coming on. I was just telling you when we, like, right before we started recording that I met you through a woman who sells undergarments, and I've been so obsessed with your work ever since. So it's really exciting to have you on the show. That's amazing. Thank you so much for following along. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So you have to tell me, your boudoir photography is so good. How did you decide on boudoir and why is it important to you? Oh my gosh. Well, I guess I started shooting boudoir way back in the day. It was probably about 10 years ago um, when it was still kind of taboo and most definitely more about pleasing your partner or giving a gift um, to somebody else. Um, So I guess it all started back when I was shooting weddings. And my brides would ask for, you know, they'd be very timid about it, but they'd be like, do you know, you know, do you do those like sexy photos? <laughs> they wanted something to gift their husband to be. Um, and so it started that way. And I really enjoyed working with my brides that way. I got to know them obviously a lot better in the process than I would have otherwise. Um, but it wasn't long until I realized that the benefits of, of a boudoir session were so much greater for the client than they were for the person like actually receiving them. So it was at that point that I kind of decided that I wanted to shift that narrative um, and market this as something to do, as I say, for your damn self as opposed to for anybody else, um, because it really should be done for yourself. Um, women wear so many hats. Um, and for most of us, the tiniest of our hats is our womanhood, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. where who we are as women gets lost somewhere because, you know, typically first we're hard workers and we're wives and we're sisters and moms. Um, but we tend to put ourselves and our womanhood kind of on the back burner, which is, you know, it's important for me to remind women who they are outside of their relationships with others and outside of their other roles in this world. Um, at our studio, you know, it's just about your relationship with yourself first and helping to rekindle that because most of us have really started to lose that. Okay. So Kara, this is one of the things that I love so much about your photography is that the women don't look like they are posing for a man. They look totally in their own space and like they are absolutely doing it for themselves. So. How do you do that when you make women look so strong and comfortable in their bodies? Is there a secret to bringing that out in them? Yeah, well, well, thank you. Um, I really do take that as the ultimate compliment because mm-hmm. I can't remember the last time that someone actually came in and dropped their robe and said, I love everything about me. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, every single woman that comes to me has their insecurities. And regardless of you know if their intention is primarily to do um, the session just for themselves or um, if they do intend to give it as a gift as well, um, they they still are terrified. They're all afraid. Um, I, we do such a good job of over edu- educating our clients. Um, we take really great care in making sure that all the verbiage is on 
the website. As soon as they book, they get a really thorough explanation of exactly how it's going to go. Um, they know everything coming into it. So that really helps put their minds at ease. It's not, there's nothing left to be questioned, which I think is where a lot of that fear comes from. And then when they get to the studio, I mean, myself and my team do such a good job of just calming everybody down. Um, we take great care to make sure it's an amazing customer service experience. Everybody on my team has had sessions with me, multiple sessions with me. So they know exactly what it's like to be in the client's shoes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when they're in hair and makeup, they can get reassurance from my stylist that, oh my gosh, I know I'm all, I'm terrified every time. And I don't know why, because every time we start, it's five minutes into it. And I completely forget that I'm not wearing any clothes. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's just important to, to let women know that nothing is expected of them. They don't need to come in looking any sort of way. They don't need to come in knowing how to do anything. They don't have to know how to pose or how to look sexy. Um, they just have to show up and um, trust me. And I direct absolutely everything. I always tell people I'm, I'm OCD enough for everybody. Um, and I'm also not one to... Um, completely discredit a woman's insecurities. Um, if I know a woman cannot stand her, you know, X, Y, or Z, I'm not going to force it on her and, and think that, you know, my photography is somehow going to cure her of her ailments. Mm. Um, I am very conscious of it. And I'm very, um, very careful um, about women's feelings because they, you know, we have all of them. <laughs> we have so many feelings and yeah. really important to, to make sure that they're comfortable and that comfort really shows through in their photos. Um, if you see, if I sense any sort of um, trepidation or any sort of discomfort, I pretty much just put the camera down and have a conversation with them about something completely unrelated um, just to kind of get them to let their guard down a little bit and let them know that th this is really just kind of a, a fun girl's day with me. It's not um, not to focus so much on the final outcome, although, you know, that's my job and um, just to really relax and enjoy themselves and let this be about them for once, because as soon as they leave my studio, I guarantee they're off to do a million other things, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So who do you think should have a boudoir session done? My answer is every woman. What's yours? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, every woman really should. Um, although I will say that after about, you know, a decade of doing this, I can adamantly say that really every woman should have one, but should also hold out for the boudoir photographer that she knows is what she wants. Um, and even if that photographer is out of the country or, you know, out of budget, whatever it is, you know, save up is definitely worth saving for and worth the wait. And I'm certainly not saying that that should be with me, although I'd like it to be. <laughs> um, but I do know the value of a really amazing boudoir experience. Um, and I really know as well on the flip side, the, the damage that a terrible boudoir experience can have on you. Sure. Uh, so I really don't think that every woman should just run right out now and and Google boudoir photographers in their area and book with whoever pops up first um, and who's in their budget because it's really important for an experience like this to be personalized and to be in line with what you are envisioning. So um, saving up, finding somebody whose values um, you admire and who whose values are you know, they align with yours. And then also, obviously, you know, somebody whose images speak to you and whose style that you love. And, and chances are the, um, the person that is going to fill this need, the photographer that's going to fill this need is probably going to be like a little bit of sticker shock for you, or they're probably not going to be in your hometown. Um, you may have to travel a bit for them, but it's truly, truly worth it. And it's definitely not something that you want to skimp on and definitely not something that you just want to be like, okay, Kara Marie says, I need a boudoir experience and everything will be fixed. So I'm just going to go out and Google <laughs> because I'll tell you right now, there is a very, very wide array of um, what is considered boudoir photography experiences out there. So, um, and I think it's just really important that you find the, the person that's going to drive the best with what you have to offer. So you have a great experience and you're not scared of it for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I haven't even considered working with anyone else yet. You live on the other side of the country for me, but I'm like, I already know when I do it, it's got to be with Kara. Because oh. what stands out for me is the, not just the level of the quality of the photography, because I seriously look like high fashion, like editorial type. I don't know if I'm using the right terminology, but you like that. Thank you. 
like I like found it in Vogue or something like that. You guys, if you're listening to the show and you haven't heard of Kira Marie Boudoir, go find her on Instagram. Hit pause on this episode quick and then come back so you have a concept for what we're talking about. But carrying on, I see when I look at your feed, it's these the women look strong and they look empowered. And I was like, well, certainly they must all be models. So I was so shocked when I messaged you and you're like, nope, not a one. <laughs> no, none of them. Yes. No, 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 no. Um, but we kind of give them that experience. You know, we want every woman to feel like they're having themselves featured in a editorial fashion shoot. We want them to feel that way. And um, I think we achieve that um, based yeah. on all of our reviews. It seems that we achieve that. Um, and genuinely obviously the the finished product is very important and um i am always working to um make my images better and i'm always learning but it's the it really is the experience that makes it um people will send me their reviews after they've left my studio and they've never even seen an image um mm. so that that just says a lot about the way that we work here yeah absolutely so in the work that you're doing, how do you keep it fresh and interesting? Because a lot of what you do is in your same studio. <laughs> it sure is. Um, well, let's see. Should I be honest? Um, yes, of course. Um, <laughs> I think it's something that every creative professional struggles with. Um, if you were to ask me this question two months ago, I probably would have said, all my work is garbage and I need to start from scratch. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I mean, I'm half kidding, but <laughs> honestly... Um, creatives really go through this self-destructive cycle of thinking that they're really, really amazing and untouchable. And then um, the opposite of that thinking that they should just throw in the towel and quit because they see something that is so unattainable for them. Um, It's just kind of, I don't know what it is about us artistic brains. That's just kind of how we think. Um, But anytime I find myself shifting into that kind of negative space where I'm like, oh, I'm shooting like in my studio again, you know, I, we do up to 10 shoots a week here and it's not a big studio. (laughs) It's that we're about 1300 square feet. Um, very small. And the shooting space that I use all the time is really only about half of that. So huh. um, it's it's a very small space and it is um, challenging for somebody with a creative brain to, uh, you know, use the same corners of the room all the time in the same window. But I think every time that I shift into that mindset, I have to re- remind myself that, you know, it's the client's first time. It, it's her first time in the studio and she's never, you know, posed on this, on this bed b- before. And she's never stood in front of this window before. And that's why she's coming to me. Um, and then also, you know, giving myself a little bit of a break, like a creative refresher is really important. So as soon as I start to feel that like monotony kicking into my brain, I'm like, all right, nope, I need to take time. And I will go, even if it's just like, I had a reschedule, I'll go out and into Austin, like just downtown and just like sightsee, like a tourist and, and see things that inspire me because I'm definitely um, stimulated by visuals. So I need to see new places. And unlike, I think, unlike a lot of Um, people in the creative field and a lot of photographers, my routine is very routine. It is, I have a very, very regimented schedule. So I am doing the same exact thing every day at the same exact times. I have photo reveals at the same time every day. I have um, shoots that are always at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. I always have the same exact lineup. Um, So if I have, like I said, if I have a reschedule, I'm out of here. Like I'm really trying to uh, make the best of that and make sure that my brain is, is seeing some new things and being stimulated and travel always does that for me. And just looking to, to old fashioned photographers, um, like really brilliant minds like Annie Leibovitz and Irving Penn and Sally Mann, um, just looking through my art books and things like that. Um, I don't spend a whole lot of time studying um, boudoir photography, honestly. Um, Mm -hmm. I will look instead to um, really old school fine art nudes and just things that I can add into what I'm already offering and that are different, different than industry standard, we'll say. Mm -hmm. Um, So um, yeah, like I, I, nothing gives me creative boost like that. Just looking at um, inspiring art and forcing myself to take kind of mandatory breaks for travel or just for R&R. Um, it, as soon as I'm doing that, I'm like, oh my God, where's my camera? <laughs> so it's like <laughs> an instant boost to start working again. It's really interesting. 
Huh. Now you mentioned that you keep a really strict regimented schedule. Is that by choice or by necessity? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I think initially it was by necessity. Um, and I, I kind of just over the years have worked into this schedule um, that it works for myself and my family and my clients. And um, in fact, it, it's gotten so regimented that it's it's booked really far in advance, which has gotten to be a, just a tad frustrating for me. Um, Cause I get it's like for me to just have a random lunch date with a friend is really hard. And I feel like kind of a jackass when I get a text like, Oh my God, I haven't seen you in forever. When are you free for lunch? And I'm like, um, how's March 16th? <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's like the worst, but I, I know that I'm doing it for a purpose and, and um, it, it works. It works for us. Yeah, it must be really satisfying just to be at that place in your career where you are that booked out. It is. It is. I have to remind myself of that, that that's a, it really is a blessing. And I'm really lucky to be doing something that I love full time and actually having a successful career with it. Um, so anytime that I'm, I'm kind of down in the dumps <laughs> because, oh, got to go, you know, I have another 10 a.m. I have another 2 p.m. I have another 4 p.m. It's, you know, I have to remind myself that that's a really good thing. And I'm really lucky to have that. Yeah, absolutely. So now you were talking about family. You and your hubby, you both run businesses. So how do you navigate the who does what of having two entrepreneurs with two kiddos? Well, I think that makes us certifiably crazy. Uh, (laughs) We're insane, insane for doing this. Um, But I mean, running a business sounds so much more glamorous than it actually is, as you know. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, people think that's you know it's the American dream, and and wow, look at you! But really, like you, everybody that runs a business is probably on the verge of a mental breakdown at any given point. my husband is a saint. He is a saint. Um, he is supremely level headed and logical and brilliant at business. He, he runs his own businesses. He can juggle all of these tasks, all of them. And then all of a lot of the house stuff too. And he keeps his cool. And, and then me, I can either juggle all of my tasks or I can keep my cool. I genuinely can't do both. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. on top of everything that he does in all of his businesses, he's you know, my savior at home, he does, he does all the cooking. He does, you know, he does laundry. He's really involved with our kids. He picks them up from school two times a week, sometimes three, if I call him and I'm like, I am slammed and I just can't get home. Um, so he's, he's able to be pretty flexible with his schedule in the afternoons and the evenings. So, um, he's just really a saint. We we've been together for, um, 18 years this week, actually. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Um, So we know each other really well. And he knows immediately when he can sense when I'm overloaded. And although it takes a lot more to get him there, I can tell when he's at his capacity as well. So we're just a really good balance. And if it wasn't for him and my children, I mean... I would, I would work 24 hours a day, (laughs) but if Mm -hmm. it it wasn't for, for him and the kids, um, I would be absolutely insane. I I would be really crazy. (laughs) Yeah, I hear you. We're much the same. My guy is an entrepreneur too. And we split the duties really evenly. There's some stuff where we each have our own niche. Like we know this is the thing I do. But then there's the other stuff that could kind of fall in the momming category that he's really awesome about stepping up with a lot. So I know how kind of... um. The frustrations can come in when you have two entrepreneurs trying to figure out who's going to do what with these little people we've created this week. So I always admire when other people are pulling it off too. Absolutely. It's it's really, it's something. It's really interesting to see how we work kind of like a well-oiled machine. And I'm always proud of the fact that we run a very, being that I'm the only female, it's, it's me versus three boys. Uh, <laughs> it's a very feminist household, which is huh. really cool. You know, there's no... Um, the gender roles are kind of, um, we shattered those, but, um, except when it comes to like killing bugs, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. <laughs> Boy's job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Okay. So if there was one woman you could photograph today, like as soon as we hang up the phone, who would it be? Who is your dream gal? Oh my gosh. Okay. So there, there's probably a list a mile long, um, but the very first person that pops into my head is this woman named 
Iris Apfel. Do you know who she is? No. Nobody. Okay. So she is, you probably would if you saw her. She is like 95, 96 years old, like a fashion icon. She's a fashionista, a fashion designer, interior designer in New York. She's, you know, in her mid 90s. She's really like lived a freaking life. And she has the best sense of style. And she just looks like the most fascinating person on the planet. Um, she's just got this sense of um, femininity and confidence and she just knows who she is. Um, I would love to photograph her. I would mm. love it. I just have a thing for fascinating people and she is definitely high on my list. Huh, cool. Would that be a boudoir suit? I don't care if it was. Yeah, I think that huh. would be amazing. My oldest client was 86 and it no was way, one of really? suits of all time. Yes. There's just something that comes with age um, that, uh, you know, I get all, most of my clients are in their mid thirties to early forties, I would say is like my average range. Um, of course there's people on either end of that spectrum. Um, and you know, and they're, but what I find is the older the woman, the more she's just secure in who she is. It's not that she doesn't have insecurities, but she's just like, you know, here I am, this Mm. is me. And that, that's a barrier that's really hard for me to break down otherwise. So having a woman come in that's already in that place that I don't have to kind of work to get her there, it just makes the experience so incredible. Um, so I'm, I'm really fascinated by um, working with mature women. I love it. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so what are you doing to expand your experience in 2018? I can tell you why I asked. It's because I saw that you're going to travel overseas. So if that's your answer. (laughs) Yeah, it would be part of my answer um, to expand my experience. I mean, I would definitely, I will be taking on less, um, 1000%. I have done, um, I had the, I have this little problem where I see a hole in my schedule and I feel like it needs to be filled. Hmm. Um, And that's not good for anybody. Um, We've built a really, really booming business, which is outstanding. But I have to remind myself pretty regularly that the business can't go on if if I'm drowning. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. um, I have for 2018, um, I'm taking far less on. I am sticking to a very mandatory number of shoots. Um, and even if I have wiggle room or I have an extra spot that can be filled, I won't fill it if I'm already at my max. Um, so that's part of it because that's, I think that's really going to help me enhance my, um, client experience as well, even more so. And then traveling, um, traveling is something that, um, my husband and I love to do. Um, we travel every chance we can. Um, there's been several, um, places on our list for far too long that have been put off. You know, I kept saying, well, I, you know, I want to go to Italy, but I can't go to Italy for a long weekend. You know, I need to go for a long time. So Mm -hmm. having, you know, two to three weeks to take off is a different story than a long weekend. Um, And it just kept getting put off and put off and put off. And then it was like, what about the kids? You know, I can't leave the kids for three weeks. Like, what am I? So it was um, over dinner. um, So my husband and I got adventurous last year. This whole kind of self-transformation started for me last year. It was like, you know what? Enough of this. I'm wasting too much of my life, like not doing amazing things that I've always wanted to do. And mm-hmm. I always wanted to take salsa lessons. So, Oh my, my gosh, husband, me too. <laughs> I, yeah, I always wanted to. And it, we, it just kind of the stars aligned and we have a friend um, whose girlfriend is a brilliant um, salsa instructor in Austin. And so we signed up for couples salsa lessons. And we did that, um, once a week on Wednesdays for eight weeks. And then after our salsa lesson, we went to dinner and had like a cocktail or two, which is like, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but for us, it was huge to have something scheduled like that, that we, you know, we, it's been 18 years. Like we've lost date nights. Like those Mm -hmm. don't happen very often. We've got kids and businesses and usually we crash on the weekends and we just, hang out at home. We don't go anywhere. So that was big for us, but we were sitting at dinner and I was like really digging the way that everything was transpiring with, you know, me just forcing myself to do things, even, you know, just working it into my schedule. And I was like, you know what, this summer I propose that we work from elsewhere. We take the kids and we go travel Europe for the summer. Mm. And my husband being the logical brain that he is, is usually the one that kind of reigns in my, my big dreams. (laughs) And (laughs) 
He's like, well, you know, that's a good idea, but, but in this case, he just raised his glass and we cheers. Then that was it. Huh. <laughs> that was it. We decided at that point that that was what we wanted to do. So we are going to be spending the summer traveling Europe with the kids. And I will take a couple of shoots while I'm there. Um, because apparently I do have, um, followers there, which I had no idea, which is amazing. So that's going to allow me to um, just have a few a few sessions and kind of get my creative itch <laughs> scratched mm-hmm. and, um, and then come back in the fall just like ready to kick ass. <laughs> I love that. Are you uh, taking help with for the kiddos? I love that we travel with my in-laws a lot. So we get parent nights out. You know, we're not, so we're not, uh, which I, I'm trying to figure out how that's going to work. But um, we are having um, our very close friends are meeting us in Greece. So we're going to have a few friends meet us here and there um, to kind of experience different cities with different people. Um, we may have one of our moms coming with us to Paris. So um, just little things like that. But uh, overall, no, it, it will be just, it'll be a trial um, of of our patients, I think for sure, because we do not plan to have um, a nanny or anybody with us. It's just going to be our time with the kids. So we'll see how it goes. (laughs) Yeah. I'll be really curious to see what you experience. Me too. (laughs) Okay. So then tell me what is a big obstacle you have hit in your business or your life, personal life, and how have you navigated it? Definitely saying no. Um, my, my 2017 schedule was, was the worst. Um, it was the best. It was record setting. Um, I hit all of my business goals and surpassed them and, um, the schedule was packed full. Um, but it, it was such an obstacle for me because I, there's this expectation when you run a business that, you know, you just, I think people, especially with photographers expect that you're, you're, maybe desperate for business or you think you always want more business, um, which is not the case in my case, which is good. It's a good problem to have. But, um, you know, I don't really take it very well when someone's kind of expectant, like, Hmm. but I, yeah, but I need a, I I need this for Christmas. I'm like, well, okay. But, um, probably should have thought about that before (laughs) December 15th. Um, So yeah, 2017 was a struggle for me in that aspect saying no. And I actually just really dove into a lot of like personal development and, and honestly like self-improvement, self-help kind of books to just Mm -hmm. really practice saying no and being able to stand my ground and know when I was at my capacity and know when I just couldn't take anymore. Um, so, and also, you know, relying on, um, other people that are really important to me and influential to me in, in the business world. And, you know, my husband to just kind of reiterate that what I, you know, that my decision to say no was the right thing to do because I do need that. Um, I'm a very strong, confident person and I, generally know what's right for me. I don't always act on it. Um, but it, I really do kind of crave that approval from the, like a very select few people that I know, like they know me, they know my business and they know what I aspire to be. So I really kind of, I need that approval or that like just little pat on the back, like, yes, that's the right move. Like good for you say no. Um, so yeah, it was definitely saying no, that was the problem. (laughs) That was my but you got to the core of it. You feel like you kind of nipped it in the bud this year. Yeah, I'm good now. I'm good. (laughs) That's awesome. Okay. And then what do you say to a woman who has a big vision and isn't sure how to get it off the ground? So that's one thing that I, I will say has always come very naturally to me. I've always been a very like naturally driven, hardworking person. And I was brought up let's see, how do I say this without my parents feeling bad? (laughs) My parents really um, didn't help a whole lot along the way. And I'm appreciative of that now because um, it did, it shaped me into the hard worker that I am. And it showed me that things don't fall into your lap. They really don't. And working hard is really important. Um, So I am lucky to have that going for me kind of naturally, but what has helped tremendously are, it's going to sound really cliche guys. I'm sorry, but but, the journaling, but with kind of with intention. So I really love, there's this thing out called the best self journal. 
it is kind of like a guided journal and it's created exactly for that reason, kind of helping you get your, your visions and your goals off the ground and making them um, come to fruition. And you write down your very specific goals. You write down the steps that you, all the steps, every little teeny tiny step that you need to take to achieve each goal and each milestone. And then you give yourself a time frame. Um, and you, you know, you work on this journal five, 10 minutes a day. You sit down every morning and every evening and, and check things off and write in new goals. And that has helped me so much because as silly and mundane as, as it is, it's something that you're forcing yourself to look at every single day. And you want mm. to know you've made progress every single day towards that goal. Um, so that best self journal, I've been through three of them now. Um, and that's really been amazing for me. And then also, um, like vision boards, um, that's very Oprah of me to say, but a vision board, um, is very like visualization is really key. Um, you know, put, if your dream is to, you know, move to Italy, you know, get a little villa in Italy, you know, put a damn picture of Italy up somewhere that you're going to see it every single day. Um, we have technology on our side now. Um, so you can create, you know, a vision board on Pinterest or something, but I do recommend actually, you know, printing something out and having it somewhere, like whether it be a photo or a series of photos or a collage somewhere. Um, I have this really lame idea that turned out to be brilliant. Um, we took a, in our home office, we have kind of a long, skinny closet, you know, one of those closets that goes under the stairs um, and it's got shelves and it, it, we just didn't need it. We have so much storage space in the house, which is odd. We kind of built it that way, but um, we had extra storage space and I took that closet and I made it into a little like meditation nook. Uh, my kids call it the peace closet, mm -hmm. uh, which I really need to work on them calling it a closet because I feel like they're going to go to school one day and tell their teacher that like when they're mad, they have to go in the closet. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy puts me in the peace closet. <laughs> <laughs> but they, it's totally elective. They totally elect to go in there. But that's kind of where I keep, you know, I keep my journal in there, uh, like my incense, all my hippy dippy shit, as my husband would call it. And, uh, you know, any like visualization or any mood boards or anything that I, I'm really working towards, I have those right up on the wall in my meditation closet, which is pretty cool. And then that's just somewhere that I go every single morning. I set my alarm and I get up and I get my tea and that's where I head and I do my journaling and I, and I, look at my goals, um, and I make them happen. Does it feel rigid doing it every single morning? It does. You know what? It doesn't. That's the one part of, of my routine that doesn't feel too forced because I really do enjoy doing it. And I've over the last, I'd say even the last six months, I've seen such growth from it that I'm excited. I'm excited about it every morning. Mm, I dig it. Yeah, I haven't printed out an actual vision board yet, but I finally started pulling together these images. I always have these images in my mind. So I told you I want to do salsa dancing. Haven't yeah. done that one yet, but I'm really inspired by like, um, I don't know if you know Misty Copeland. She's the first African-American female principal dancer with American Ballet Theater. Just the um, way her body moves is like yeah. stunning. So I'm like... I'm so intrigued by it all the time. I wonder if my body can do it. So I finally started putting up little images all over, just on my laptops or even printed up a couple. And it took me, I think, about two weeks of looking at them to start training with an aerial contortionist. <laughs> that's amazing. See, that's exactly it. That's what you did. That's amazing. Good for you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm all for that. That visual thing, just to kind of remind you what your passion is. Women kind of think they have to do it with like the thing they think they have to do in life. But if you can yeah. do it with your dream, oh, that comes about really fast. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, well, cool. I love it. I think we'll pause right there and take a break. When we come back, I really want to know what book you're thinking about. Ooh, sounds good. Great. This segment is brought to you by Audible. For you, my friends and listeners of The Audacity of She, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial so you can check out their service for yourself. I've used Audible consistently month over month to have access to all of my favorite books. To see my recommended list and start your free trial, visit theaudacityofshe.com slash books. Again, that's theaudacityofshe.com slash books. Okay, Kara, we are back and I really want to know what is one book you recommend that all women read for their personal development? 
Okay, so I'm going to cheat. I have two. Go for uh, it. <laughs> I have a. I read a lot. Um, I really do, um, and it's all nonfiction. Um, and I can I can get more into that if you feel. But I, so there's one that I just finished that I'm just blown away by. It's completely mind blown. It's called the Practical Neuroscience of Buddha's Brain, um, mm-hmm. and it it really just digs into how we can shape our own thought process. Um, it's, you know, whether or not you're, you're Buddhist is really, um, I think everybody can kind of appreciate the principles of Buddhism, which is just all about, you know, creating, um, self love and respect and discipline and happiness and, um, being kind to others. And it's really fascinating to learn, to read about how you can kind of reprogram your own mind to be peaceful and happy. And um, because obviously as women, especially, we just have a lot of noise in there. We have a lot of self guilt, um, really hard on ourselves. And that, I mean, over time that wears you down and it can make you very negative and it can make you very bitter and grumpy. And, and we don't want to be that way. Um, so I, I'm, really fascinated by that book. Again, it's um, The Practical Neuroscience of Buddha's Brain, and it's by um, Rick Hansen is the main um, author. He's a doctor, and there's several other doctors that contribute to this. So it's really, you know, nerdy and scientific, and there's like, you know, graphs and pictures and all that kind of thing. It's, It's really absolutely fascinating, and it's not as difficult of a read as you would think it would be. Um, so that one for sure. And then um, because I just finished it, so it's fresh in my mind. But also, um, I'm really fascinated by um, the strategies of successful people um, and like the routines of successful people. Um, and I think we're in this really cool place right now where women are really starting to take ownership and really starting to um, be comfortable with coming out as, you know, career woman or, or, you know, kind of breaking the gender molds a little bit, um, and not being afraid to be successful. So I read a lot of, um, success books and business books and things like that. But I, um, an author that I've been following for quite some time is Tim Ferriss. He is a, um, he kind of describes himself as a human guinea pig. He likes to try everything and learn everything he possibly can. And he's fluent in I don't know how many languages. And he decides kind of like what you were saying with the, with the dancer, you know, she just looks so beautiful and elegant. Like he sees something like that and he's like, all right, I'm going to learn how to do it. And he mm. drops everything he's doing and he'll take three months and go and set out and learn whatever it is just so he's he can do so many things. He has so many skills. But recently he's really taken to interviewing other successful people. Um, so he has a series of books. His first one was called four hour work week. And that was a long time ago. Um, and that was my first book of his, um, that really, um, kind of helped me learn to outsource and do things a little bit more efficiently. But the most recent is called tribe of mentors. And that is, a giant book. It's terrifying to look at because it's it's definitely the largest book I own. It's huge. Um, And in it, it's basically just a compilation of interviews with really, really successful and brilliant people in all different lines of work. You know, there's professional athletes and there's investors and there's actors and there's just all kinds. And he asks a lot of them the same questions, very similar questions. Um, like, you know, how do you start your day every day? What do you eat for breakfast? But it's really fascinating and it's really inspiring to see all of the walks of life that everybody comes from and how amazing because he does tend to interview uh, the people that he interviews are just people you want to be. They're just, they're super inspiring. They're, um, they're hardworking. Nothing really fell into their lap. Um, so I, I'm really fascinated by that book. And I think, um, every woman, especially, you know, those that are feeling maybe a little bit of guilt of trying, uh, trying to juggle it all and, you know, trying to take on a career. And then if I do that, does that make me less of a mom? Or, you know, if I, if I choose to stay home with my kids, does that make me less worthwhile? I just think it's a really good read for literally anyone, but especially women, um, just to show you all there is out there to achieve and how you can do that no matter what you're, you're faced with. Mm, Love it. 
both really good references. I think I know my list for the next week now. (laughs) Well, Kara, I don't have any other questions for you. Is there anything else you wanted to add? No, I really appreciate it. Um, I had a lot of fun. I I was telling you um, on the break that I I really genuinely loathe the sound of my own voice. So anytime (laughs) I get a podcast request, I, I... say thanks, but no, no thing. <laughs> Going back to that learning to say no thing. Um, but when you reached out, I was like, oh, well, I have to do it because I'm really, um, I really dig what you're doing. And I love that you're, um, you know, just kind of bringing women together and we're raising our voices and, and being powerful and strong and successful together. So I think that what you're doing is awesome. So I was excited to do it. Oh, that's so awesome. Thank you so much for being a part of it. And for anyone who wants to follow you, how do they do that? Um, so Instagram is kind of my jam. That's my that's my space. Um, so my Instagram handle is Kara Marie Boudoir. That's K-A-R-A-M-A-R-I-E. And then Boudoir is the hard part. It's B-O-U-D-O-I-R. Um, so I'm on Instagram at Kara Marie Boudoir. And my website is just www.karamarieboudoir.com and um, we'll be announcing something pretty big in the in the new year too. So there'll be some more accounts to follow, but um, that'll be coming up in the coming weeks. Oh, love it. Ladies, if you haven't gone and looked, do it right now. Otherwise, you're really missing out. Kara, thank you so much for joining us today. It was so great having you. Thank you, Dana. Did today's topic inspire you, encourage you, or challenge you to look at your own processes in a different way? Join us in our Facebook group to continue the conversation. It's where all the good stuff happens after the show. It's theaudacityofshe.com slash Facebook. Again, that's theaudacityofshe.com slash Facebook. See you there.